Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and that was solo number three from Advanced Funk Studies by Rick Latham. This is a pretty difficult solo because of the tempo, and it's in the style of Harvey Mason, the great drummer who played with so many artists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and into the 90s. One of my favorite records he's on is a Lee Rittenauer record called Stolen Moments. Harvey Mason's a really interesting drummer because he's a great funk drummer to hear him play with Herbie Hancock, but he's also an amazing jazz drummer. If you listen to some of those old Jerry Mulligan, uh, there's one at Carnegie Hall with Jerry Mulligan and Chet Baker, and he's killing it on there. So uh, a lot of people don't talk about Harvey Mason anymore, but he's really one of my favorite drummers. So you definitely need to check him out. And like I said, that Lee Rittenauer record, it's on GRP, which is a label that's no longer around, but uh, he does some amazing playing on that record. So see if you can check it out. Anyway, this is uh, from that great book, Advanced Funk Studies, that I'm doing a series on. I'm doing all the solos. And like I said, this one's difficult because of the tempo, and it's a really well-written solo because it's thematic. In other words, you have this rhythm So that's the theme, and then the rest of the solo are, is variations on that theme. So you're keeping that, that thing going between the kick and the snare. Sometimes the snare is in different spots, but uh, Rick Latham ingeniously builds on that theme, and it's pretty complex. So let's break this solo down, because so far this would have been uh, the hardest one in the book. We already did one and two, and they're not easy, but this one's kind of a big step up technically. Now, uh, you'll notice I moved my ride a little closer today, so the bell would be a better target. I do not have these memorized. I'm reading them. I'm a little old for memorizing things at this point. I'm kind of out of RAM in my brain, so I kind of have to read everything. And if I had it memorized, it would be a little bit easier because I could see what I was doing. So I would suggest that you memorize this solo so you can aim for the bell. Also, you want to use a cymbal with a big bell. This cymbal has a uh, kind of a medium-sized bell. It's a Sabian Jack DeJunette Special Edition cymbal. It's got a great bell. It doesn't get too annoying. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of um, the kind of person that gets annoyed by the bell of a cymbal really quickly. Like a lot of drummers play a lot of cymbal bell, and when my students do it, I get on them because it just, I don't know, there's something about it that drives me nuts. It's good in small doses, but if you overdo it, it drives you crazy. So I do, uh, you know, follow the instructions for the music on most of it, but that one part, uh, the third line from the end of the first page, I am going to the cymbal there. Because for me, it's just a little too much bell at that point. And then I bring the bell back at the end. So uh, you can do it however you want, but that's the way I do it. But also, like I said, the cymbal is a little bit closer for this particular thing. Now, a lot of times I'll play one up, which means there's just one tom here and the floor tom and no tom here. And that way I can get my cymbal a little closer. So a lot of times when I do funk gigs where there is a little more bell or even Latin gigs, same thing, I will do away with this tom and just play one up. And I know a lot of you play a three-piece kit as well. All right, so that's sort of the setup I'm using. And again, cymbal with a big bell. You could even use an 18. An old cymbal that would work, if you could find it, is a, a Sabian El Sabor, which was a timbali cymbal. If you look at my timbali videos, you'll see that cymbal. It's got a huge bell. It's like half the cymbal. So uh, that would be a good one for, to use for this kind of stuff. It's actually a good funk symbol too, because it's got a great crash and a great bell, if you can find one. They're no longer made. So after that theme comes in the first time, then we have the first um, variation on it. So we're in halftime at first. And then Rick adds a backbeat, Rick Latham that is. All right, and then he starts adding embellishments with the cymbal. So this is the thing that a lot of drummers in the um, 
late 70s and 80s did. Steve Gadd was one of them. Harvey Mason was, was another. Two surface riding. So, you know. You could just go to about any club in New York that was playing like jazz fusion, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, and you'd see drummers playing like that. And I think that Steve Gadd, at least on the East Coast, probably started that. He was the first person I heard do it with Chick Corea on some of those um, early records. Uh, Friends is a really great Chick Corea early record with Steve Gadd on it. And he does a lot of that two surface writing on there. So that's something you want to practice, just moving your right hand between the ride and the hi-hat. So uh, the second theme is this. So let's talk a little about playing on the bell of the cymbal. The part of the stick that I like to use is the upper shaft, better known as the neck of the stick, like this. Of course, you can use the tip. But that's going to be pretty weak, and it's probably not going to cut through the, the band or you know whatever else you're doing, you're playing with. So I would suggest playing with the, the uh, upper shaft, the neck. Now you can also play on the regular part of the cymbal like that with the neck as well, and that sounds like this. And any cymbal sounds great like that. The old Ks, the original Ks, sound amazing like that because they're so dark. So you're really using a big part of the stick like that when you really get uh, you know, to the exciting part of the tune. So that's something to think about as well. Now, I did get away from the bell in the uh, sixth line there when I did this part. Uh. It's good to take a break from the bell, and also that makes playing that a lot easier. You know, if you memorize it, it might be easier, but you're really stretching it. So it's okay to do that, especially in this solo. It's nice to have a little bit of variation. And then that next part with the three hi-hat notes is really tricky, so. And uh, that's an old Steve Gadd thing. He used to do that quite a bit. So let's break that down, and I'll show you how I work on that. If we do it slowly... So that's the pattern. Now, if you open the hi-hat, just open it just a little, and I, there I keep my heel slightly down. Now that part's tricky because you've got to play three notes on that hi-hat quickly, so you want to bounce that there. Don't try to use your wrist unless you're, you know, well, Buddy Rich, he's not with us anymore. He could do that. And Joe Morello could do it as well. But it sounds better if you go nice and light and ghost it. You know, those notes are not necessarily uh, accented too heavy. Uh, so you don't need to do that. The bass drum is, but not the hi-hat. So fast, it sounds like this. And I would suggest maybe improvising around that, like you saw I added another tom. Those are things you can do, uh, you know, experiment, like we did in the first two videos. And then what happens is the solo kind of whittles down to this, so... And then it kind of pyramids out. Then we're back to the beginning. So it kind of fades out technically, not volume-wise. So it's a really brilliant little solo. I love it. And it's one of the more challenging ones in the book, solo number three. So that's it for today. And just email me like you always do with your questions or, or leave comments, whatever you want to do. And we'll see you next time with solo number four. Thanks.